Special Field Order Number 15, or better known broadly as 40 Acres and a Mule. Special Field Order Number 15 was the first systematic attempt to provide a form of reparations to newly freed slaves in the United States of America. There are, like most things, misconceptions about how this came about, so we will be discussing that today, including some contemporary takes on reparations and how they will help the United States as well as impoverished black people. If you are new here, please consider subscribing, hitting the bell, and liking the video if you enjoy the content. Links to everything are in the description. General William T. Sherman was the proverbial figurehead of this new radical idea. Sherman met with 20 black leaders of the Savannah community, mostly Baptist and Methodist ministers, to discuss the question of emancipation in 1864. President Abraham Lincoln approved Field Order Number 15 before Sherman issued it just four days after meeting with the black leaders. Congress also gave the go-ahead. With the federal government's blessing, Sherman's radical plan for land redistribution in the South was actually a practical response to several issues. Although Sherman had never been an advocate for freed men, his land redistribution order served the military purpose of punishing Confederate planters along the rice coast of the South for their role in starting the Civil War, while simultaneously solving what he and radical Republicans viewed as a major new American problem. What do we do with a new class of free Southern laborers? Congressional leaders convinced President Lincoln to establish the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen and Abandoned Lands on March 3, 1865, shortly after Sherman issued his order, as it came to be called, was authorized to give legal titles for 40-acre plots of land to freedmen and white Southern Unionists. In a later order, Sherman also authorized the army to loan mules to the newly settled farmers, hence the 40 acres and the mules. Even more shockingly was section 2 of the article, quote, On the islands and in the settlements hereafter to be established, no white person, whatever, unless military officers and soldiers detailed for duty, will be permitted to reside, and the sole and exclusive management of affairs will be left to the freed people themselves by the laws of war and orders of the president of the united states the negro is free and must be dealt with as such meaning that there was to be separation but this land although under the jurisdiction of the united states these lands would be free and moreover controlled and owned by black freedmen. Moreover, Section 3 granted these lands protection, quote, in the possession of which land the military authorities will afford them protection until such time as they can protect themselves or until Congress shall regulate their title. So, what happened? In case you are unaware of the process that occurs when a president is incapacitated or is unable to discharge the powers and duties of his office, the vice president immediately becomes acting president. That would have been President Andrew Johnson. Johnson was a Confederate sympathizer, and within months of Lincoln's assassination, President Johnson rescinded the order and returned the land to its former owners. The same owners that declared war on the United States. Congress made another attempt at compensation, but Johnson vetoed it. This was a monumental step backwards in terms of delivering reparations to the former slaves. And so the book has closed on reparation. And the question has come up multiple times. Will the United States rectify its promise? 2.6 trillion dollars that is the estimated cost of reparations by william a darity jr an economist at duke university and a leading scholar on reparation darity claims that roughly 30 million americans would be eligible some people often ask during this debate why should i atone for the sins of my father so much so that you see this trope in the media constantly even in my favorite shows like steven universe 
allow me to put something in perspective for you. Then you can make your own opinions in the comment section civilly. You are a farmhand. You have been beaten, bruised, battered. You keel over. You have died. You have exhausted all of your life, all to make another man rich, with not a penny to your name or to give to your child. You die, leaving this world an inconvenience to your master. You die knowing that this quite possibly will be the same end your sons and your daughters meet. You weep, and nothing comes out because you're dehydrated. This was the death of millions of slaves over the course of nearly 400 years of slavery. While for 400 years, those who owned these slaves would accrue massive amounts of wealth and buy and sell slaves. Three generations later, you find yourself working in the same field as your great-grandfather. Only this can't be traced because slave owners didn't care to keep records well. You are now freed, except Jim Crow has been put in place and you find yourself enslaved once again. 26 years later, they ease restrictions. You find a job working elsewhere under someone else. Great! The only thing is, you still have no right to vote, or anything of the sort. Good luck getting a house, and now it's your kid's turn. Your kid finally purchased a home. Still working for your old boss because that's the only way he can possibly get hired because he cannot go to school. And sadly, he cannot negotiate his pay because, well, no schooling. So he finds it even harder to make ends meet as inflation rises. All the while, his now great-great-grandfather's old slave owner now has great-grandsons who are pioneering oil companies and using the wealth accrued to spend it in and amongst their own community, effectively gaining money and redistributing it to white communities. And while I would like to continue this analogy of the atrocity of white supremacy in America, I will have to reserve that for another video. The point is that while black Americans were trying to get their feet underneath them, the white majority was making themselves wealthier and wealthier. Don't believe it? Let's talk numbers. According to the Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances, the median wealth of a black household is 16000 compared with 163000 for white households. How about some more numbers regarding inequality? In the United States, after a congressional study, people of Japanese descent who were forced into internment camps during World War II received 20000 in 1988 and a formal apology. Since 1952, Germany has paid more than $70 billion in reparations through various programs, primarily to Jewish victims of the Nazi regime, and continues to deliver hundreds of millions of dollars each year. Payments vary from a lump sum distributed to individuals to a monthly pension based on years working in the slave camp. Money is also given to organizations to cover home care for older survivors or for grants. A small portion goes for research, education, and documentation. Meanwhile, in the most progressive country, we are having issues with racism even being acknowledged in textbooks in Texas. In 1860, over $3 billion was the value assigned to the physical bodies of enslaved black Americans to be used as free labor and production. Cumulatively, this was more money than what was invested in factories and railroads combined. In 1861, the value placed on cotton produced by enslaved blacks was $250 million. Slavery enriched white slave owners and their descendants and it fueled the country's economy while suppressing the enslaved in every facet of society, economically, socially, educationally, medically, and residentially. Now on to the question at hand. Will reparations ever happen in our lifetime? Likely not. Here's why. 2008. The United States officially formally apologized for slavery and Jim Crow. In introducing the resolution, Representative Steve Cohen, 
a Democrat from Tennessee, noted that despite the government issuing an apology for interning Japanese citizens and later pressuring Japan to apologize for forcing Chinese women to work as sex slaves during World War II, the American government had never formally recognized and apologized for slavery. And while I am not a fan of comparing scars of trauma, his statement speaks volumes. While the apology was primarily symbolic, by officially recognizing its role in perpetuating the horrors of slavery and Jim Crow, the American government took a step forward in addressing and atoning for one of its greatest wrongs. However, many people are not content with just that. On April 11th of 2020, Georgetown University did something exceptional. Two-thirds of the undergraduate student body who took part in a referendum voted yes to creating a reparations fund for the descendants of 272 slaves that the university sold in 1838 to save the university from bankruptcy. Currently, Georgetown's endowment is valued at nearly 1.8 billion US dollars, a premier American institution of higher learning built with blood money, much like the entirety of America. In order to make amends, the beneficiaries of this blood money asked Georgetown students to increase their university tuition fees by $27.20 each semester to honor those whose lives finance the college continued existence. Acknowledgement and taking steps to make amends are the first steps to becoming more progressive and learning from the atrocities of our forefathers. Unfortunately, due to current events, it seems that we are moving in the footsteps of our forefathers. Once again, this channel is not an echo chamber of political opinions. However, I wish to express that bodily autonomy is important and critical and moreover is an essential human right. It should not be a political debate. With gun violence on the rise and the governing of bodies, this looks to be a circular return to the barbaric United States of yesteryear. With that being said, if you'd like to get access to resources for any life event, please check out my Twitter. I will be posting and reposting resources for learning, contraceptives, and what you can do to help. If you will be protesting, please be safe. Be mindful to vote and vote for those who support your own values. Moreover, I encourage you all to look into Supreme Court Justice Clarice Thomas, his dissenting opinion on Roe v. Wade. Namely, he stated that Griswold v. Connecticut in which the Supreme Court said married couples have the right to obtain contraceptives, Lawrence v. Texas, which established the right to engage in private sexual acts, and Oberto v. Hodges, which said there is a right to same-sex marriage. He stated that all of these should be reconsidered, saying that those rulings were demonstrably erroneous decisions. While what he states does not have legal precedent power, it does encourage more conservative states to pass legislation that might not be in line with the Supreme Court's past decisions, allowing the case to be constantly repealed and go to the Supreme Court in which they can overturn these decisions. It is not a difficult thing to do, unfortunately, as we have seen. That's all I have to say on the subject, on this platform. I encourage you all to pay attention to what is occurring. I will be trying to cover as much as possible. Please like and subscribe for more. And remember, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to feel its warmth. Thank you for watching. Stay curious.